<laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. We want to welcome you all to our first, maybe only. We'll see if um, if we if people actually listen and we decide to do more of these. But uh, our our first recovery task force uh, coffee chat roundtable, totally off the cuff, but totally scripted. Um, I'm Josh Shanani. With me here is Steve Ehrenberg, Todd Polinak. And for the first time, although has been involved from the very beginning, Mr. Joe Shannon, uh, we haven't been in touch with you uh, in the last several weeks or so. So we wanted to just come back together to give you all an update as to what we've been hearing, experiencing <clears throat> with the never ending world of PPP1, PPP2, the employee retention credit and the IDA loans. So we're going to hit on a few key topics. Um, and answer your questions. So that sounds great. Let's let's keep moving. Okay, let's keep moving. So <clears throat> what are the topics? All right. So the first topic, PPP1. Um, what does that say? Evaluating loan amounts or should not have. Oh, okay. With the SBA. Yeah. Okay. So so with respect to PPP1, hopefully at this point everybody is has received their forgiveness from the SBA. If you haven't, there's probably still, you know, a little bit of time left, but make sure you make that a priority. We have been hearing that banks um, have gone back and are evaluating original loan amounts. And some of you who are listening may have gotten letters from banks saying that you were funded too much. Um, in most cases, these are loans that were funded based on original computations uh, which included 1099. So if you're one of those people, we think it's imperative that you work with the bank to um, modify the loan agreement, if, if so, to exclude those amounts and apply for forgiveness um, on the revised SBA loan amount. Um, we know the banks are anxious to get these done, and I think it's important that as borrowers, you you uh, play ball. Now, what what we haven't heard is how you have to repay this money, whether the money is due on demand or if they will work with you to repay the money over time. So, Josh, can we talk about that for, <clears throat> for a minute? Yeah, sure. You mind? So, some banks that we've met with are seem to be very lenient. They just basically took the information and passed it through to the SBA, and others are kind of playing like they're an extension of the government. If you have a situation like that, the latter as opposed to the former, what are some things that a client can do in dealing with the bank? I mean, is there any recourse that they have or who should they be consulting? I guess I'm asking because we do have some situations where the banks have been not really great um, and have not been friendly. And some of them are the bigger banks and some of them are not the bigger banks, but mainly the bigger banks. Steve, you look like you have an answer. I'm going to answer that one. Thank you, Todd. Uh, I, I think that each situation needs to be looked at on its own, but I, but making sure that you have all your records in order, be it your application, your your original loan application, including having your approved loan amount and the actual loan number. That's something that's very important. But but even just taking a step back, just make sure you have all your documentation, be it why you needed the loan back when you took it out originally your PPP uh, payroll and how you came up with the amount so that your loan amount was calculated, all your FTE support and all the other documentation. Because we have seen where even if the loan necessity questionnaire has been struck, which it has been, the SBA is asking for sometimes some similar information. Uh, not quite to the extent of the loan necessity questionnaire, but in certain instances, the SBA is asking for information. And then that may not necessarily be tied to your loan amount. So it can be on small loan amounts where the where the SBA looks to uh, audit those as well. And Steve, just to add to that as well, I've I've heard in a couple instances where um, a lot of the questions also are surrounding um, partner compensation and partnerships and K ones. Um, again, is another kind of area of contention that not everybody understood back then, and I think still not everybody understands right now. So. What about um, getting an attorney involved? Because I know in some of these cases, it seems like things are not going the right way. And what type of attorney would you be consulting on this? 
I have no idea. You should ask questions you don't want to answer to. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would think you would ask an attorney <laughs> who's involved, who understands the SBA rules, yeah, and who understands the banking uh, rules. Well, I, I would say to that, just to, again, I would look at your, you know, who, which attorney are you most comfortable with? Who knows about your business? Um, this isn't really a specific matter, but I think that's a good idea. Somebody with SBA knowledge, somebody who knows how it works, but just make sure you're working along with somebody who has deep knowledge of PPP and how the, the process works. And I wouldn't, uh, I, I certainly would go the route of providing additional information. We had two clients that were, uh, did not get full forgiveness in their initial determination, and both of them went back and uh, contested that determination, provided additional documents and follow up correspondence, and both ended up receiving full forgiveness. So, um, Certainly, as soon as you get that, there's a there's a seven or ten day window that I would get back to them as soon as you can, to let them know you're contesting and and provide the additional information uh, as to uh, as to what they need to give you full forgiveness. Perfect. And then I guess the only other question I would have with that for Joe, Steve, since you've been working on that is, we know we know they've challenged loan amounts. Has there been further challenges on? loans that were given to potentially ineligible entities because of NAICS codes? I have not heard any of that. We, we did have some initial uh, pushback from some banks in the summer of 2020 as far as lending the money, but I, I've not heard anyone having any issues on asking for forgiveness, trying to make a determination that they were an ineligible entity at this point. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm in the same boat, but it uh, doesn't mean those that's not coming. So as we know, the SBA has considerable time, even after forgiveness is granted. So it is possible that there's some sort of look back now. We certainly hope not, um, but it, it's hard to say at this point. So forgiveness is not really forgiveness, is it? Hard to say. I think, I'm hoping that th this is the end of the process, but there there is an out in that the SBA can come back and audit you even years after you get your forgiveness decision. So I hate to be the wet blanket here, but uh, that certainly is a possibility. Are we advising of our clients to set the money apart as a reserve, just in case? I don't think that's necessary, no. but I think it is important to keep all the documentation because, yeah. like Steve said, they've given themselves <laughs> six years. So, you know, maybe today it's not an issue, but a year, two, three years from now, if the government is hard for money, you know, who knows? That'll when and how year, this, you know, you, mean, you know, when you know, when and how this gets dug back up. So yeah, for now, keep everything. Dot, you know, keep 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 all your documents together. If you haven't gone through the process to really formulate, you know, um, put all put put all your thoughts down and make sure you have adequate documentation. We've been saying that since day one, and I'll say that for every day for the next six years because we don't know what's going to happen. Just, just one reminder about PPP. One, I just had a conversation with a client yesterday. If you've got small loans, there is a 3508S. There's a simplified form, and you can go directly to the SBA now uh, and file the application instead of going through the banks. So um, just had a conversation with someone yesterday who was struggling through tying out payroll documents and pulling all things together. And they, they didn't had no need to do all that. It was a simple yeah. two-question form, and you could – Directly to the SBA and be done in 10 minutes. So, um, just as, as these as time has gone by, when we've talked about forgiveness, people can forget there's there's other options than the the full form. But just just keep that in mind. Yeah, it's a good point, Joe. And also too, it it is possible that if your 10 month period has expired and you still haven't received forgiveness from the SBA, you could have gotten received your first invoice for the bank yeah. in order to repay that loan know that there still is the opportunity for the loan to be forgiven and and this is just a, really more a matter of paperwork following you know a, a specific date so if you got the invoice and you're still waiting for forgiveness um, it's not necessarily a reason to be concerned it could just be timing of, of, of paperwork crossing yeah and just to add to that if you got your forgiveness application in within the 10 month period some borrowers have been receiving requests from the bank to start making payments as well. Th those may be false or faulty. Um, so they may be auto-generated and may not be correct. So definitely before you start making payments, check with the bank because I have seen these types of letters <clears throat> go out and then subsequently be withdrawn. 
Great. Good point. Okay. So why don't we so why don't we segue to PPP two? PPP two. Staying on the okay. PPP train. So a lot of folks obviously have received the money, spent the money. There's a lot of pressure on us, certainly, to start applying for forgiveness. So I'll throw it to the group. You know, what are you hearing in terms of applying for forgiveness on round two? I mean, I've I've been had a few conversations, but certainly we still have the same rules as PPP one. So you have ten months from the end mm -hmm. of your cover period. So there's same no forms. there's no immediate rush. The same forms and um, all those. Some banks were looking to get these applications. Uh, there's other, I would have a guess that most of the banks are still want to get PPP1 off their records and get these loans cleaned up before they start worrying about PPP2 loan applications for forgiveness. So um, there's certainly no immediate rush uh, to get those forms filed right now. Right. And just a reminder again, <clears throat> it's 10 months from the end of your covered period, which could be eight weeks, 24 weeks, or any period in between. And I think it's still important to look at PPP forgiveness in conjunction, Steve, with our next topic, and that's the employee retention credit. Good segue, thanks, Josh. I think that that's huge. And we all, well, maybe we don't, but the timing in terms of receiving your uh, employee retention credit uh, refunds, and as a reminder, the, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, the American Rescue Plan Act removed the mutual exclusivity between ERC and PPP. We love we love acronyms here, but they removed the mutual exclusivity to basically you're allowed to claim both and can go back and retroactively claim this. And, and we've seen a marked difference in terms of the timing of receiving those funds if you receive the request on a originally filed 941, which is the quarterly payroll return due 30 days after the end of each quarter, as opposed to filing it on an amended return. So while there is a rush uh, in terms of a, a timing of cash flow to get that in, uh, you, you certainly don't lose the opportunity to have between three and five years, depending upon when you claim it, to even to, to go back or to currently claim the benefits. So there is opportunity here to claim the employee retention credit. Uh, and we just saw the new rules come out from the IRS related to Q3 and Q4, but in that same breath, the Q4 ERC it may go away with, with these new infrastructure bills and, and other uh, you know legislative items that come out. So the Q4 amount could go away, but we did see the, the new rules come out related to Q3 and it contained a lot of information and some clarifications, uh, even some being retroactive clarifications related to how to treat the wages on your tax return, what to do when you have greater than 50% related ownership and you're definitely going to want to check those rules if you haven't before because uh, they're a little bit uh, arcane and hard to read and uh, you're going to want to pay attention to those because it, it's almost uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a shock to the system uh, when you're taking a look at those but if you do have questions you can reach out to us yeah and i think our advice to you is if you are filing for the credit on an amended return I think the message is be patient, yes. right? The IRS is being inundated with amended returns, um, at which point, you know, they haven't even put the infrastructure in place to start reviewing and start and start remitting. We've started to see some payments trickle in um, for amended returns that were filed, you know, back in December, the beginning of January. So you are looking at nine months. And I, I think to go back to the point that Steve made originally, is that if you can claim the credit on the originally filed 941, so for the Q3, right, the 941 will be due by the end of October, uh, be due by October 31st. The payroll company will most likely ask you for all calculations that first or second week, the latest of October. If you're due the credit, claim it then because you're guaranteed to get the payments much faster. And just one other thing, and this may sound silly, but the question's been raised. If you use a PEO, you must go through them to claim the credit. You cannot file your own 941 under your own tax ID number to claim the credit. You're kind of at their mercy. Um, and they have their own rules and deadlines in place as to when you have to provide them with certain information in order to claim the credit. But I throw it out to the guys. 
Is there any other weird quirks, things that we've experienced that would be helpful uh, to the people inside the computer? Inside the computer, Josh? <laughs> no, I think just making sure that you don't double up on the weights. The PPP should come first because that's full forgiveness. But hopefully you, there's enough wages left over or you have other non-payroll costs in which you can claim the benefit for both. But something you're going to want to look at jointly. Yeah, I think that's I, I think that's a good point, right? And in, and in any given quarter, you're allowed to allocate the wages first to the employee retention credit, and then the remainder to the PPP. So again, both of these between the PPP and the ERC, tremendous opportunities to help with cash flow, especially during these times. And then the last thing I think we wanted to touch on was the idle loan. Now, mon now months ago, we know that the SBA um, put forward uh, the ability for people to increase their loans from 150,000 to 500,000. We've had a lot of people apply. Not all have really been successful. Um, I think there's still a lot of uncertainty as to what's going on on the back end with the SBA and why certain loans are being processed and some are not. I know they are asking for additional information because as SBA loans exceed that $150,000 threshold, there is a personal guarantee that's involved there. So it is more information gathering on their end. Um, like I said, and I'll, I'll ask the guys, I haven't had, clients have not had tremendous success getting these. Have you experienced anything different? No. No, I only have very few clients who actually uh, went down the idle route because it's a, like you said, a <clears throat> traditional loan program. So they didn't want to necessarily have to go through and pull back the curtain and re re provide and reveal all this financial data as well as provide a personal guarantee when there are other funding sources that were available. And, and the other thing with that too is remember, the SBA is reaching out to you about whether you want to increase the loan. So if you haven't, if, if you received an IDA loan and you never got any further communication, check your spam folder, chances are it may be there. Um, people were getting emails, they thought they were, you know, fraudulent or scams, but no, that is the way that the SBA is contacting people. So. If you've received emails and you're unsure, by all means, send them to us. We're still here. We're still a resource. Yeah. If you have if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. What's Joe our... Shannon is always available yeah. to help you. <laughs> What's and the email address again? COVID19 at saxllp.com. Perfect. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, guys. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. We'll catch you on the flip side.